Well, welcome, welcome everybody. My name is, uh, is Dr. Kyle Nagel. Oh, there we go. That seems to be catching better. Um, I want to thank the organizers for having me here. Um, they asked me to give a, a talk on um, common uh, sports, youth sports injuries. Um, so I am going to, well, it kind of catches them and then drops. Okay. Um, I apologize for the, for the sound levels on this. Um, yeah, so we'll just get going now. There's a few people here. If you guys have questions who are in the room, obviously, um, feel free to pipe up. Um, I'll try to repeat it into the microphone so that people who are uh, viewing it on stream are, are able to hear it. This seems to catch in and out, but I'll just keep going with it. Okay. There we go. Uh, I have nothing to disclose um, and no relevant financial interests. Uh, here are the uh, objectives for the, for the day. Uh, I'm just going to uh, discuss how to diagnose uh, common acute and overuse injuries, uh, initial management for those, and understand when to refer these injuries to specialists. So uh, a big thing with, uh, with youth, with sports injuries in general, is history. Um, and if you can get a good history of it, it can tell you a lot. A lot of it is, uh, I'm a simple guy, a lot of it is just simple, like physics. Say, if you know the knee went this way, then you have a good sense of, hey, it's these structures that are probably injured or not. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, kids can't, aren't, even adults, not just kids, I'm not just trying to uh, uh, slam on kids, but uh, sometimes it's much more just like a Peanuts cartoon, you know, where they just, people just kind of collapse, they fall over, there's a big cloud of dust, and then they stand up and say, yeah, something hurts, you know? So you can only get some of it. Uh, obviously, there, we see more and more people coming in with like videos and stuff. So if you can get that information, that's great. But really, kind of like sport and what the mechanism of injury is uh, can be key to this uh, to this process. The physical exam. Um, I, I do a lot of, of teaching of fellows and residents um, and other learners at, at uh, Seattle Children's. And I, what I always tell them is that there's five components to any physical exam. Um, and uh, the one that always gets people is the last one, actually, which is special tests. There are a lot of special tests in, uh, in ortho realm. Um, but if you remember the first four, that's 80%. That's passing. So start with those first four, OK? So it's going to be inspection, just looking at it, OK? Range of motion, palpation, and strength. And so those ones, if you remember those four, you could actually get a lot of the way. Any, any extra that you do, any of the special tests, that's extra, like, that's frosting. So if you can just remember those four things, you, you actually get a pretty good sense of what's going on even from those. Imaging is another question. Um, and it's always kind of like what images to take and when, and you know, should I get these images before sending them to see a specialist or not? Um, I'm biased because I am the specialist in this, so I will get x-rays on almost everybody. Um, but I think that there are certain things that you may not need x-rays on if it's very clear-cut apophysitis, which we'll get into down the road, like Oscar Schlatter, you may not need them right away. But then the question is, you know, if you do want images, what kind of images to get? I would say plain films always have a low, low threshold to get plain films. Um, a lot of people will kind of, I think it's kind of a historical thing, will say, hey, the specialist is going to want an MRI. I'm going to order that MRI for them. Now, there's not radiation with MRI, but is it expensive? Um, and there's different quality of MRI studies out there and different cuts that they different different protocols they can have. My general rule of thumb is that if you are not comfortable reading the image, don't get it. You know, just send them to us. We'll get what we want. We'll get it, we'll order it right. There are times when even an MRI is like, hey, gosh, I really wish this MRI had come with contrast versus not. So uh, if you're not comfortable reading it, that's my kind of general rule of thumb. Treatment, um, this is, for most sports injuries, this is kind of like the treatment protocol I use, you know. Uh, pain control, uh, usually I just end up using just over-the-counter NSAIDs for the vast majority of my patients. Again, kids, kids tend to get better. They don't often need anything more, more than that. Injections, almost never with kids. I can't, I can't tell you when the last time I did an injection. It's different than adults, okay? Just kids have so much healing potential that they do that. Rest is an interesting one. I usually actually reframe this. Instead of just rest, I will talk about activity modification. Okay, and so, and this is actually kind of, can be sometimes uh, part of the fun of this, is to figure out, hey, this athlete, this, this kid still wants to be active, and it's like, hey, do you need to completely shut him down, or can you say, hey, can we modify what you do? Can we say, hey, what about not impact stuff, but you can still get on an exercise bike, or, or an elliptical, or a lot of schools will have that, if the, you know. 
Um, can we uh, modify things so if you're just doing conditioning, hey, get out of your cleats and run in running shoes, you know, or try to run on soft surfaces, things like that. So that's one of those things that I think is, it can be helpful is to try to modify the activity without necessarily just completely shutting them, them down. Obviously, if there's an overuse thing, address the reason for the overuse. If it's a training error, great. If it's a biomechanical thing, go for it. Rehabilitation, PTs are my best friends. I actually only partially joke. I uh, really don't joke. PTs are like, they're the ones who are actually doing the work of what, what I do and getting, getting kids back to the field. Okay, PTs can be really good. I tend to frame this when I send people to that, just because of our current modern sports structure. I will often say, hey, this is really good. It'll help your pain, which people want to get rid of anyway. But they will oftentimes have a lot more buy-in if you say, hey, not only are you going to get stronger and the pain's going to go away, but you're going to get stronger. You're going to have a better core. This is going to help you perform better. You're going to actually come out of this as a better athlete than you were before. And they'll, get out. they'll, they'll be much more motivated to do that. And then eventually get a gradual return to sport. So as far as when can they return to sport, these are the things I look at. Basically, can they function normally, right? So do they have no pain? Swelling is gone. Do they have full range of motion, full strength? And can they do what's needed in that sport? Okay, so without being risky. If they, uh, kind of a simple rule of thumb for me is, hey, if you are limping, you probably shouldn't be playing. Okay, so if, if, even for those few things that I'm like, hey, and we'll talk about this, there's a few things where I say, hey, if you can tolerate the pain, that's fine. Go ahead and play. But if you start limping, then I get worried about either compensatory overuse injuries or that you're going to have different mechanics and then just lead yourself to see me for different things. So that's why I don't want to do, okay? So again, physical therapists can be very helpful for this. They have a lot more room. They have a lot more tests. They can do a lot more in a PT gym than you can necessarily in your, in your office. So here's a, here's a case, okay? So 13-year-old year, uh, uh, female, right knee pain for about five months. Um, it's in the anterior aspect of the knee. It was worse with running, impact, squatting kneeling, there's no swelling, that's a no, no known injury, this just kind of came up, it's just kind of been bothering them. Um, she has a history of biking, playing hockey, dance, soccer, the pain is directly over the tibial tubercle. Anybody know what that is? Yes, yeah, so Oscar Schlatter, okay, so some of you guys have seen this, it's very, very common. In fact, a lot of the other things that are apophysitis, which is what this is and I'll talk about, um, I will often describe as, hey, this is just the same thing as Oscar Schlatter, just in a different spot, because so many people have heard of Oscar Schlatter. X-rays and MRI, because this person had gotten an MRI from, a, uh, from their PCP, were normal. This definitely does not need an MRI, so an MRI would be over treatment and we really don't need it for this. This is a differential diagnosis of, of chronic anterior knee pain. It can be long. The key with anterior, insidious onset anterior knee pain is really where it is. It's like, hey, you just give me that whole story without the physical exam. I'm like, eh, it could be a lot of different things. But if you say, hey, it's directly over the tibia tubercle, it's like, that's Oscar Schlatter, you know, like, that's what it is. Um, but a lot of these other ones are similar to that, or what, you know, like Cindy Larson Johansson, if you're in the know, we call it SLJ just because we shortened everything. Um, but it's, you know, it's just, it's where it hurts. So if you're, if you're palpating the knee and it hurts right over the patellar tendon, patellar tendonitis, okay? If you're palpating over the knee and it's right over the Hoffa's fat pad, which is on either side of the patellar tendon, is Hoffa's fat pad. So it's, you know, we aren't super creative. Um, but it's, it, that it tends to be what, what, you, what you can follow. So here's just a re little an, a review of anatomy, okay? So patella, here's the patella tendon, so if it hurts right there, Hoffa's fat pad would be on either side of, directly on either side. Um, quad tendon will sometimes be bothered, but the big ones are here. Wait for it. I just saw Hamilton the other night, so just embracing my inner Aaron Burr. Um, here's uh, the tibial tubercles right there. Those would be the most common ones that you see in kids. So this is x-rays. Now, the interesting thing with this is that these x-rays are completely normal, okay? So this case, if this was a normal, you could get these x-rays and be like, does a kid have Oscar Schlatter? I don't know. Because Oscar Schlatter is more of a clinical diagnosis, right? So this could be normal. It depends on if it's symptomatic or not, okay? So if it is, looks like this, you could be like, it could be Oscar Schlatter, because it's still, the apophysis is still open. Once it fuses, then you're like, hey, if you have a 17-year-old kid who's coming in, you can be like, that's not Oscar Schlatter. I don't know what it is, but that's not Oscar Schlatter, because that, that, that physis is, is closed, okay? But if they have this, then the next question is, hey, was this an insidious onset? Did it come on gradually, or is this an acute onset? Okay, because you can have fragmentation here, but if it's acute onset, they're running, they're sprinting, and they said, it felt like someone in the other lane just hit me, just kicked me in the, in the knee, 
then it's like, hey, that, that's, then I'm thinking more fracture, okay? But if it's a just gradual onset, this is, I would say, normal looking x-rays, that's what it is. Sometimes you'll see this big prominent bump in the front there. Um, but again, sometimes they don't, sometimes they do have some swelling there. So apophysitis, um, apophysitis. Uh, it's, it has an itis and it talks about inflammation. If you look histo histologically, they, they actually don't have inf any inflammation. So I just tend to repeat that or, or kind of not use that term or say, hey, it's apophysitis, but it's really not inflamed per se. It's just pissed off, right? And so a lot of people would be like, yeah, it's just irritated. And it's related to repetitive, repetitive action, okay? So a lot of these apophysitis just have to do with your pounding or using it over and over again. And I tend to frame it more as just a developmental stage, even though it's called a disease. I find that freaks people out more than not and just like, hey, this is more just a developmental condition, you know, and it will get better as time goes on. That's the good news. The bad news is that it might last for a couple, a couple years to do it, but uh, it tends to be just from overuse. So if we can modify that activity again, then we can uh, help that out. And so there's a lot of these uh, all over the body. Uh, Osgood Schlatterer, uh, Cindy Larson Johansson is at the inferior pole of the patella, Seavers disease at the calcaneus. Uh, there's a bunch around the pelvis, and the pelvis ones can actually, the uh, apophyses around the pelvis sometimes don't fuse until the late teens or the 20s. So that's one that can happen later. Um, Iceland's disease at the uh, fifth metatarsal, base of the fifth metatarsal. Um, sometimes, again, you'll, you can have fractures there. So again, acute versus chronic, okay? Chronic overuse is different. Little league elbow is also an apophysitis of the elbow. So for Osgood Schlatter, um, classically, it's kind of that early preteen age. There's a bump that you may or may not notice a bump underneath the knee, but that bump is where it hurts. Okay, it's directly on there. It's a prominent tender tibial tubercle. Um, Seavers disease, similar. Uh, again, if you just look at this, it's this totally normal x ray for, th for this age. No difference. So oftentimes, Seavers will have a, um, the calcaneal apophysis will have some more fragmentation there. Again, totally normal. Um, I've heard of one case of an acute apophyseal avulsion fracture of, this, of the heel, um, but that's, that's it. I'm, otherwise, it's not. In general, the treatment for apophysitis, regardless of where it is, is the same, okay? So activity modification, a lot is just reassurance being like, hey, this is okay. You can still do stuff. If you have pain, but you're able to maintain your good normal mechanics, you can still play. And you know, like if it changes location, changes nature, changes how it feels, then let me know. But anticipate it's gonna get worse with activity, better with rest. Big red flag is if it's not getting better with rest, then let me know, okay? And a lot of times it's just time. For receivers, sometimes these um, heel cups, these silicone heel cups can be helpful. Um, they can get those online. Uh, they can, if you, if you stock them in the clinic, you will use them uh, if you treat pediatrics uh, on, on a regular basis. The Chopat strap, this patellar tendon strap, Chopat is, uh, I don't know if it's a brand name, actually, it's just kind of the name of the, the uh, kind of brace it is, but it's a patellar tendon strap there, um, can sometimes help as well. But for both these things, I'm clear with parents and patients that this is for pain. There's no structural thing going on, so this should not cause arguments between parents and kids, right? They have enough as it is. So this is purely for pain. If it doesn't help, then toss it, like it doesn't need to. But some people find it does help. Patellofemoral pain is kind of this catchphrase for any anterior knee pain that does not like specifically overstructure, okay? So it's like, you rule out everything else, it doesn't hurt, it kind of hurts every, maybe it hurts over the patellar facets, something like that, but in general it's just a kind of like anterior knee pain without any other source. Um, oftentimes, it, again, insidious onset, it just happens, it hurts around the, the front of the knee. Uh, some of them will have pain if they sit for a long time, it's called the movie goer sign, or if they drive for a long ways, like getting out of the, um, seat can sometimes have that. Um, they will have, if they have tenderness, it'll be around the, the patella, um, underneath the patella. The x-rays can be normal. Uh, sometimes they can show this uh, a little bit of a, of a lateral patellar tilt, so it kind of leans off to the outside a little bit. The biggest thing with patellofemoral pain uh, is hip, hip strength, okay, what we're finding. And for a lot of things now, for chronic overuse injuries, you kind of go up the chain, and you're like, oh, hey, actually, it's your hips that are weaker and not the actual an issue with the knee per se, okay? So the good is systematic review, but the strong evidence was for weakness of the abductors. That's your glutes, your big old butt muscle there. Actually, it's a little one. It's the glute medius specifically. Um, but that was a, the big thing. So a lot of times if I'm wondering and needing more buy-in, you can actually have them do a kind of a side-lying leg lift, okay? And if, if they have 
decreased strength on that, or particularly if they have, if it's only have, if they're only having pain on one side, on one knee, you have them do that, and they're like, if they're demonstrably weaker on one side than the other, sometimes that can help with buy-in as far as the PT as well. So management, um, like I said, it's, it's all this bottom one. <laughs> Physical therapy, okay, that's the big one. And a lot of times they're gonna address core and hip strength, and this is one where I'll definitely be talking about, hey, this is gonna help you as, in your performance down the road, it's gonna help you, you're gonna have a stronger core, you're gonna have something more solid to, to explode off of and do stuff, and it's also gonna treat your pain too, okay? Relative rest, I'd say activity modification. I'm not gonna keep anybody out from doing things with, the, with, with patellofemoral pain, okay? But I'm gonna say stuff like, hey, Again, if you're limping because of it, that's a good sign you need to rest, okay? Or I'm gonna say, hey, if you play in this tournament, this is a really important tournament coming up, that's fine, but just be aware that we're trying to, you're kind of pouring gasoline on a fire we're trying to put out, right? And so hey, if you can take some time to modify your activity at some point, I mean, everybody, every time, all throughout the year now, a lot of times is the super important time for their, their sports, uh, so they believe. But it's, you know, at some point, you're gonna have to find the time to take take the time off. So physical therapy, like I said, hip strengthening is a really big component of this, okay? And part of the reason is that in order for your hip, I'm going to demonstrate here. Um, if your glutes are weaker, okay, anytime you're standing on one leg, you have to fire this glute in order to keep your pelvis level, okay? And so I'm going to demonstrate this. And if you think about running, how much more power, I'm going to kind of exaggerate this a little bit. Think about how much extra force you have when you're running and going at speed, okay? But if you're standing like this and you're coming down, if you wanna come down straight, but if you're not strong in the hips, you're gonna start dropping this hip down, okay? When you drop this hip down, unless you thrust this hip out, you're gonna fall over, okay? And so if it's just, this hip drops down, you thrust this hip out, you're gonna be pulling that kneecap farther to the side, okay? Whereas if you tighten this up and you keep it level, then the kneecap will track straighter in the, in the, in the trochlear groove, and then that stops the pain. Okay, so sometimes in clinic, I'll actually just do that exact spiel, talk them through that, and say, hey, that's why we need to get that hip strong. Other man management options, uh, usually if they're gonna use NSAIDs or ibuprofen, I typically say after the event, um, rather than kind of pre-dosing or pre-treating. Bracing, not a huge amount of help. Some people will do kind of a patellar stabilization brace, um, and I, I don't often do it, uh, but if for some reason someone seems to have a lot more like patellar laxity or something like that, then maybe. Taping, a lot of PTs will do this. Uh, the thought is more on a short-term basis. It's kind of like, again, it's more of a patellar stabilization type taping, but it's not great evidence for it. Orthotics, a lot of people will say, I don't know, it's down in the foot. It's because you are, you need a medial heel wedge or something like that to throw your knee, you know, farther out to the side. Uh, I would argue that's kind of looking in the other direction. Uh, again, the d data shows no significant benefit from orthotics. Surgical treatments, I would, wouldn't even consider surgery for this. Now, if there's other things going on that are there, then maybe. But strictly patellofemoral pain, not going to do surgery on that. I'm going to bring this up because this is one of the reasons why for anybody with acute pain or even chronic pain, I will get x-rays, okay? Because this can mask, and I actually see a lot of it, granted, my, my patient population is very, very biased, okay? But for, for you guys, if you are seeing someone and they, hey, it's not getting better with some of these activity modifications and stuff like that, this would be one reason why you want to get x-rays, okay? Osteochondritis desiccans, we shorten it up to OCD. I, be, I make sure to tell people it's not above the neck, different OCD, okay? This is below the neck. Um, but it's a, basically a softening of the bone underneath the cartilage, okay? And so then the risk is that with OCD is that if that bone becomes soft and you keep using it and keep pounding on it, then you're going to get that a piece of ch cartilage will chip off, okay? And basically you end up with early osteoarthritis in a, you know, young kid is not ideal, right? We don't really know why it is. There's some thought and some data to support that it is some sort of an overuse thing, just repeated pounding. And I'd say a lot of there's anecdotally, there is a little bit more like the kids I tend to see it in tend to be more active, but this can present in really weird ways. But it can be that, hey, I just have pain. I mean, the worst case scenarios is like, hey, I'm having mechanical symptoms and there's no really injury a lot of swelling off and on swelling, then I'd be like, hey, we need to get an MRI, or not an MRI, start with a plain films to look for this. But other times it can just be, hey, I just have knee pain and it's been bothering me and I don't get it, you know? And then I'll get these and it'll be like, oh, that is probably where your pain is coming from. Usually we see it in teenagers or preteens. Um, it tends to do better if kids are skeletally immature. So if their phyces are still open, they tend to do better. And again, there's, a, there's differences with this. 
we will, um, um, when the open fices, they just have a lot better healing potential. You can see this in various other places too. You can see it in the elbow, you can see it in the ankle. Those are the, probably the most common places to see this. Um, but um, like I said, just have high index of suspicion, and this is one reason why, uh, by the time anybody gets to me, I assume they've seen someone else, have tried other things, and oftentimes they have. And I also just, I know more about this, so I'll get x-rays for this. But I would say for you guys, if pain isn't getting better with rest, or they, you know, they kind of did some activity modification, maybe they did do PT and they're still having pain, I'd be like, they deserve x-rays by that time, if not earlier. Uh, this was the views. These are the views I, w I like to get. A lot of ERs will just do the, you know, like one or two views. Um, the big one for this is the tunnel view, and that's, a, that's with, with the knee slightly bent, and you get a little bit better view. The OCD lesions tend, the most common spot is on the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. I'll show you some pictures, okay? But it's also a little bit on the posterior side, and so that by going into a little bit of flexion to get this tunnel view, and I'll show you what it is, then you get a little bit better view of that, okay? The x-rays also get, allow you to assess what their skeletal maturity is like. Okay, so this is your straight a AP view, right? Okay, you can actually start getting a hint of it right here. There's this weird lucency up here. You see that spot there? But then if you, oh, hey, there you go. Okay, so once they span down, so this is a tunnel view because creatively you're looking down a little tunnel right there. Okay, but then you have this little lucency right there. Okay, that's the classic spot for it. And sometimes you not only see this little line there, sometimes this whole area will just be like a thumbprint. It'll just look like, not like a true thumbprint, but it'll just look like that whole area that right there is white will just be um, dark. Okay, typically once, if you see evidence of an OCD lesion on x-rays, I would refer them on for most PCPs having, and also having been a PCP in the past. There's controversy about how to treat these, but the biggest thing is that we need to make sure, see if it's stable or not, see if that overlying cartilage is still intact, if it's cracked, and what the, that, what the status of that is. And then we'll usually get an MRI, and there's different things that we can do on that, and a lot depends on the stability, the age of the patient, and the location where it is, okay? But it's just something, to, again, high index of suspicion for weird knee pain that you're like, hey, before you just write it off as, hey, this is patellofemoral pain, just be like, hey, is this? Maybe I need to think about something else. Depends a little bit on what they've been doing or not. Uh, okay, so a history of acute knee injury as opposed to chronic. We kind of covered the chronic stuff. Any questions on that? No, okay. Um, acute knee injuries, as, again, mechanism of injury is, is biggest, most, first and foremost. Uh, immediate swelling. Most kids don't just have swelling in their knee. Okay, so high suspicion if someone comes in and they actually still have a knee effusion, there's something going on in there. Sometimes it can just be a bone bruise, sometimes it could be a fracture, um, but more likely I'm, I'm really starting to, I have a pretty low threshold for getting advanced imaging if there is a true knee effusion, okay? Kids just, uh, it's unlike adults where the osteoarthritis and stuff like that can get you that effusion. Kids with acute, acute knee injury with an effusion, I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be going in there being a little bit more like, hey, th I think there's something going on, okay? Um, location of the pain, um, that can help out. Uh, depends on where it is. Uh, ACL tears classically actually will be a lateral knee pain, but lateral knee pain can also be patella dislocation. Patella dislocation is like the, it's kind of like the syphilis of, <laughs> of sports, sports medicine, okay, of, of the knee specifically, where it can, it's, good, it's the great mimicker. It can be like, put this long list of stuff. It could also be patellar instability, okay? Um, mechanical symptoms, has it actually been giving out? Has it been locking? Has it been truly, a lot of people say, oh, my knee locks up, and I'm like, how long does it, it's like, oh, it just is a little bit, and then, it, then I just kind of straighten it out and goes. True locking is like, you cannot move it. It is stuck, it is not moving, okay? And that is concerning for me a lot. A history of previous knee injuries. For a lot of injuries, the biggest predictor of having a future injury is having had one in the past, right? And so if they have had a history of a knee injury, an ACL tear or a meniscal tear or something like that, then again, that raises flags being like, hey, I wonder, even if it's a contralateral knee. So here's this, this is kind of like your general thing. Again, there can be mixes in here, um, but if hyperextension injury uh, can be just a bone bruise, uh, that's pretty common, but you can very commonly see an ACL tear with that. Valgus stress is kind of the classic MCL, but again, if there's a lot of M uh, valgus stress, that valgus is going towards, in towards the body, okay? Do you guys know valgus and varus? You guys have that all memorized, right? Okay, varus is air between and valgus is like this. Gum between valgum is there, or you can be like the German farmer. Do you guys know that one? No? Okay, this is just me doing stand-up for a little bit. 
But the, the German farmer is chasing after the pig, and the pig runs between his legs, and he goes, Verif the pig! Okay? So you can, you can remember it that way, too. Okay, um, Varus stress test or Varus stress is pretty uncommon, okay? It's just, it's just rarely do it. I actually know some more experienced um, sports docs than I that don't often do even a Varus stress test. I still do, occasionally I'll see it, but it's, it's pretty uncommon. Twisting, particularly a loaded twisting, pivoting type thing, loading and twisting, that type thing, and it doesn't need to be very much at all, but I'm thinking more meniscal type thing, okay? Deceleration, change of direction, again, you're like, Hey, you just said a twisting thing. I'm like, yeah, there's overlap between these, okay? But the quick stop, jump stop, that's classic ACL. You know, going for a layup and landing or, or you know, doing a quick pivot and turning, going off the other way. Um, a direct blow to the anterior tibia. I see this actually more commonly. Kind of the classic one is like an older person slips on the ice and lands directly on their tibia. This is one that I'll see more, probably the most commonly in my practice in football, just where they, their legs get taken out and they land directly on the, on the front of the knee. Wait for it. Okay, here we go. So here's another one. Okay, so um, again, inspection, palpation, range of motion, and strength. Remember those, okay? And the history, you got a lot of it. Obviously, there's these other special tests looking for a laxity, patellar apprehension, McMurray's, Thessaly's. There's a lot of them, okay? You don't need to know the, I mean, you don't need to feel really comfortable with it. And there's times where you're just like, hey, even when I do the Lockman's, if someone is, comes in to, to see me, usually they're a little ways out, so sometimes I'll get it. But for you guys, you guys are probably going to be seeing them maybe a day or two after the injury. That's like the worst time to try to do a Lachman's because they are going to be flared up, they're going to be in pain, they are going to be guarding like the Dickens. Okay, so don't worry if you can't get it. You can be like, hey, there's an effusion, there was this mechanism, something's going on, right? And there's high level of suspicion that there's something else. Okay, so then send them on, let us know, let us, let us do an exam. Again, sometimes that little bit of time can be beneficial because it can let things settle down and actually get a better exam later. Sometimes you just need to say, hey, come back in a week and, you know, let me try it again. So here's another case. Okay, so 16-year-old this time as opposed to, I think the last one was 13, 15? I can't remember. Um, jumped and landed after rebound, felt, heard a pop. Um, obviously immediate swelling with it, unable to keep playing. It just feels loose. Sometimes they'll be like, hey, I, I just feel like it's going to, give out, it's just gonna not, I, I just don't trust it. Okay, so thinking this is kind of your classic story for an ACL tear, okay? Sometimes this can't even be just with a meniscal tear, but this is kind of your classic like textbook ACL tear. So the big thing with this, the Lachman's test is the big one. Um, you will, it, large effusion, there might be anterior laxity. Um, if you, the thing with the Lachman's, just if you're try, gonna try it, I'm just gonna editorialize a little bit. Textbooks will say to hold it up at about 10 to 30 degrees of flexion. I find the more you hold it up, the more they guard. Okay, so really if you get it, the biggest thing with this is to, for them to relax. And you can feel with, your, on, with this hand, oops, oh, hold on, I got this, there we go. So with this hand here, you can actually feel, actually it's the fingers of this hand, you're feeling, you're, they're, they're, your fingers are passing underneath the backside of the knee so you can feel when, when their hamstrings are relaxed or not. And sometimes you won't be able to get them to relax. But it's almost more getting, getting them, you can have it almost in full extension, maybe like 10 degrees at most. That's really when you can get it. Now the thing with this, and like I see a lot of people, even from the ER where they, you know, or ER urgent care, or things where they, they come in and say, hey, I have this knee injury. A story is exactly like this, okay? And then people will say, oh, the docs said they, they didn't want to get x-rays because there's too much swelling. Okay, so uh, x-rays go through, okay? But the big reason why you wanna do this, okay, and I would, is, I would wait on the MRI. Wait until, again, like I said before, unless you know how to read it, I'll just wait, and, wait on it. Um, is that there's a really common, particularly with kids, there's this, there's this, it happens with the exact same mechanism of an ACL tear, and in an adult, it would end up with an ACL tear. But kids can get this tibial spine fracture, okay? Do you see this little line right there? Okay, so this is the tibial spine. This is the end of the femur, this is the tibia, okay? But what happens is that instead of actually rupturing the ACL, they pull off the anchor, okay? Now with this one, so here's this one. This one's not, doesn't look super displaced. The lateral view is better, is a better view to look at that. So you want, definitely want at least two views. So if you look at this one, it looks like this here, but you look at this, there's displacement there, okay? So the big thing with it, this one is a big displaced one. Here's this big hunking piece right in the middle. Okay, do you see that little, that piece right there? Usually this is clear space. It should be clear like that, okay? So there's something bony in the middle right there. 
The reason that you want to get this earlier and know about this earlier is that if you can get this to be reduced, you can get bone-to-bone -bone healing there and they don't need to go through a whole ACL reconstruction. Okay, if you wait for four, you know, two months to get, or one month to get this x-ray, then that bone won't have that chance to heal on there. I will still end up getting advanced imaging on this one if, when you send it to me, but the urgency of it can go down. There's a high, there's a high instance of meniscal tears with these, with these injuries. And there is, just as far as counseling patients, there is an increased risk of ACL tear down the road, probably because as it yanked on that anchor, it did stretch out some of the fibers. But again, if you can get that bone-to-bone -bone healing, and you can get that piece reduced, then oftentimes you don't need to do a full reconstruction. So even if they need to go and do surgery, they can sometimes just tack that down, tie that bony piece down without having to do that full reconstruction and tunnels and grafting and stuff like that, okay? So this is one reason why, even if they get an, if you see an effusion, A, you wanna make sure there's no, if there's a big effusion, one of the things that's on the differential is a fracture, which this is, but you also wanna make sure this, even if you're like, geez, this is ACL, this is exactly what Dr. Nagel was talking about. There's a, you know, coming down from, a, from basketball, rebound, blah, 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 blah. Be like, get the x-rays, just get the x-rays. Okay, that's simple to do. So the treatment for ACL uh, in the acute sense, uh, crutches are as needed. Sometimes they'll come in and be like, hey, I'm okay with walking on it. Sometimes they'll be like, I'm okay with walking, it doesn't hurt that much, um, but it feels like it's gonna give out. Then maybe a hinged knee brace might, might be helpful. Um, I don't often put people in a knee immobilizer unless I'm really, like, unless there's something that needs stability, okay? Because a knee immobilizer will cause quad inhibition, particularly if it's gonna take them like two weeks to get in to see me. And so eventually one of the big things with any knee rehab is getting quad strength back. And so if you immobilize them, then quad inhibition kicks in, which kicks in really fast. You're gonna have to be dealing with trying to get them back in their quad back strong before, afterwards. Now if there's a fracture or something, by all means use that immobilizer. That immobilizer can be super easy, it's cheap, it's easy to put on, it's great. You know, that way it's a short temporizing. But if you're thinking, hey, this might be a few weeks before someone gets in, then start thinking about like, hey, do, do they really need that immobilizer or not? For young kids, ACL, ACL tears, we, we recommend re reconstruction, okay? So if they do have an ACL tear, there's stories of people older, I would be, probably be in that c category now where if I wasn't, if you're not doing a pivoting type sport or a multi-directional sport, I'm a big cross-country skier, I could cross-country ski without my ACL. Doesn't matter, you can even downhill ski without your ACL. But most kids, under 20, if they try to live life without an ACL, they're gonna end up with more cartilage damage, both articular and meniscal cartilage damage, based on studies, okay? So we, we almost always recommend reconstruction for young kids with this. And there's different ways to do, it depends on their age and, you know, and different graphs to do. I'm not gonna get into all that. And usually it's like, hey, whichever graph the surgeon is comfortable with is probably the best one to go with. Um, but it does depend on whether or not someone is skeletally mature versus immature. And I usually, recommend, I usually counsel people being like, hey, we will get you back. I think it's really important to, to give athletes hope because a lot of times they're pretty despondent about this. So I say, hey, we'll get you back. It's gonna be a long road. You know, it's usually nine to 12 months. They, people will be like, oh, what about Adrian Peterson? He got back in six. It's like, yeah, it's a professional athlete, totally different, totally different level of resources, different level of person. Um, so I really try to front load this being like, hey, this is nine to 12 months. And we're getting much more aggressive about counseling with, with kids. Even in sports med where we're like, hey, we don't deal with anything. Like I said, we don't deal with anything above the neck except for concussions. But um, you know, I, I think it's important and we're getting much more aggressive about being like, hey, this is taking away a lot of your social support. This is taking away your coping mechanism. This is taking away, you know, this is significant. It's your identity, right? And so we're getting much more aggressive about um, psychological uh, referrals for this, whether it's sports psych, and again, you can be like, hey, if you talk with someone who's sports psych, and there's a difference between sports psych and general counseling, but if you can find that merging of the two, granted, it's sometimes hard just to find counseling in general, but you know, if you can find that merging, it can be really helpful. But then I can say, hey, this can also get you in a better place, and you can be a better athlete, because you'll have more of a, you know, the mental strength and mental skills or resiliency and stuff like that. So there's that. The prevention, if you can get, if you guys are in a, even in a, even in a uh, rural area, you know, there are prevention programs. It doesn't take very much to, to help with this. These are some that, are, that exist out there. Uh, sports metrics, there's the PEP program, FIFA 11 plus. Th there's a ton of them out there. And a lot of times these can be done as part of the warm up for teams, okay? It doesn't take a lot, it doesn't take extra time because it can just be part of that warm up, but they've been shown to be helpful. They've shown to decrease the, the rate of injury. So if you need to talk with coaches and stuff like that, sometimes you can be like, hey, yeah, you don't wanna spend time on this because you wanna spend time on your shooting drills. Well, if your star scorer gets an ACL tear, then your 
team is gonna have a much worse season, okay? So sometimes you can frame it that way, being like, hey, one of the best things you can do for your team's performance is not to get injured, okay? It doesn't register a lot. A lot of people, injury prevention, they're like, that's not important, but again, if you can, if you can uh, sell it a little bit, you can get there. So here's another example. I'm gonna go through this one a little more quickly. Um, this is a, a wrestler. You can see this valgus stress right there. That's a good example of valgus stress on that knee. Okay, it gets bent to the inside. Not much of an infusion and the pain is much more over the medial side of the knee, okay? So much more focal, doesn't necessarily have much of an infusion. There that definitely had a compressive force on the lateral side and a, and a stretching force on the, on the medial side. Okay, valgus stress test, is just kind of just pushing in a valgus, re recreating that valgus stress, okay? You should do it at both zero and, and uh, 30 degrees. Um, you're feeling, a lot of times you're gonna get pain more than laxity. I would say uh, it's just more common to have pain than laxity. Um, oops. And so just differentiating, not all ligament injuries are the same, right? MCL sprains, I'm actually like, hey, yeah, it's an MCL, it's a ligament, but this is, you're gonna get better. Usually it takes, you know, four to six weeks-ish, maybe a little bit longer. Physical therapy, and you can get back once you can perform these things. The biggest thing that's gonna stop them is gonna be this lateral push-off, okay? So whether a volleyball player, basketball player, soccer player, hockey player, these are really common in hockey. Um, gradual range of motion strengthening, and then once they can do that, then usually they can get back to doing stuff. So very different injury, MCL versus ACL. So again, not all ligaments are, are the same. Moving on to shoulders, upper body, okay? Here's, a, here's another kind of classic example. We see this a lot. A 14-year-old swimmer, a gradual right shoulder pain. Uh, it's worse with freestyle and butterfly. This, like many swimmers, swims year-round. Um, we're thinking, I don't know if you're thinking, I'm gonna get into what, it, what that was. And again, without doing an exam, it's a little bit hard to say, but there's a couple different things that it most likely is. So overhead, overuse injuries of the shoulder, really common in overhead sports, okay? Tennis, swimming, baseball, softball, volleyball, I'd say these are really common ones that you're gonna see. A lot of times when I was a PCP, um, or now when I'm doing uh, the PPEs, um, I will counsel people who are doing these sports to say, hey, let us know if you start having shoulder pain because I'd rather be able to, again, modify activity, not shut you down completely, get in the PT, address biomechanical things and keep you on the field and let us know earlier rather than later. This is also one where if I know the athlete is an overhead athlete, one of these athletes, I might do more of a shoulder exam in the PPE than I would say someone who's a cross country runner, okay? So impingement. So this is probably one of the most common one with kids, okay? Uh, their pain in the overhead uh, position, the uh, rotator cuff, biceps, and bursa gets impinged underneath that coracoacromial uh, joint, the uh, arch right there. I'll show you pictures. Uh, impingement signs, I'll show you what those are too, okay? Um, sometimes they'll have a, a tight cuff. Um, causes, it can be anything. A lot of swimmers will be a little bit lax, but a lot of times it's just overuse, constantly getting into this overhead position. Um, sometimes it will be technique. If you have a PT who knows swimming, uh, it can be very, very helpful, but not necessary. A lot of these things, the same kind of principles apply. So here are the, here are the impingement tests. They're kind of two of them. I, I, there's a ton of tests for the shoulder. Uh, I'm just gonna do these ones um, because these are two really common ones and it's, they're the two for impingement. Okay, you have the near sign, which is putting it into internal rotation and then you extend the arm back by the ear Near sign is back by the ear. Near is by the ear, okay? Near ear, okay? So that's just a way of remembering those, okay? Everybody will stop eventually, okay? It just stops. And if you push hard enough for anybody, it's gonna hurt, right? You don't wanna do that. But most times people will come up and be like, ow, that hurts, stop. Or and sometimes they wanna get up that high, okay? But most people, you can kinda go and it'll reach an end point, but it shouldn't hurt. The other one is Hawkins, okay? or some people call it Hawkins Kennedy. I think about it as doing 90 degrees forward flexion, 90 degrees of adduction with elbow at 90 degrees, okay? Again, there's different ways people will say, people will do it all along, but basically then you're gonna rotate, internally rotate the, the shoulder, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to drive that greater tuberosity up into the acromion, okay? One, uh, uh, someone was like, how do you, so this is nearby the ear, how do you remember the, Hawk, the Hawkins? And there was a, a learner I was once working with who did it, I love it. But she was basically like, well, it's like if a hawk's coming at your face, what do you do? You go, ah! <laughs> you know, so that's the one way you Hawkins, and nearby the ear, okay? So those are the two, the two tests. You can try to remember those. That one stuck with me, obviously. 
Okay, so this, I'm just gonna use this. This is Little League shoulder, but we're gonna, we're gonna show just a couple things here. Okay, so impingement is rotator cuff. Okay, so there's four small rotator cuff muscles. Uh, they're here, but the biggest one, the most common one is that the, the supraspinatus up here comes right through underneath this arch right there, okay? And then attaches there. So think about this. If you're doing the nearby the ear, okay, you're basically driving that greater tuberosity up into the acromion, okay? So that's where it pinches. Same thing if you go into this position, you're just bringing that arm up around forward and so again, and then as you rotate, internally rotate like this, you're driving, you're being kind of sadistic a little bit, but you're driving that greater tuberosity up into that acromion, okay? So that's, you're trying to, to impinge that. You're trying to pinch whatever's in between there and see if it causes pain, right? Got it? Good, okay. So little league shoulder, a little league shoulder is, uh, I mean, it's, it's an overuse injury. It's, an, it's a, a physial injury um, with overhead throwing. You'll see it a lot. A lot of times it's a clinical diagnosis. Hey, that's where the pain is. They have open physis, thrower, okay? So high suspicion just with that history right there, okay? But then sometimes you get x-rays and you can, oh, geez, I just did that again. You see the normal physis there and then on this side it's kind of ratty, mothy, and looks wider right there, okay? The reason I'm saying you sometimes will see this, sometimes if someone came in like this with an open physis and they had the same story, exact same story, I might be like, hey, I think there's a little leak shoulder and I'm still gonna do the same thing. But if you definitely see that widening of the physis and it's like that, it's definitely little league shoulder and you need to rest. And this is one where, again, I'm not gonna say you can't do anything, okay? But you can't throw, strict non-throwing, okay? And that's the one where it's like, hey, don't even throw the Nerf ball for your, tennis ball for your dog, Nerf ball with your, with your other brother. Okay, this is just no throwing, okay? But if they, if they don't have pain with, say, batting or running or other sports, go for it. That's great, do it. Stay active. Uh, treatment of little league shoulder, again, is relative rest, no overhead, no throwing stuff. Um, this can be helpful, in, and eventually they will do physical therapy. There's gonna be a very gradual return to throw program. It's gonna be a six week program at least. Um, but PT can be helpful. Is some is just waiting for that bone to heal, right? There's nothing we can, once you have a fracture, it's kinda like, we're just waiting for the glue to dry. There's not a lot we can do. But sometimes PT can be helpful for a couple reasons. One is that it can make the athlete feel more like they're doing something and more active in their, in their care, which can be actually psychologically really beneficial. Number two is that a lot of times this comes from, again, biomechanical issues. They aren't throwing in a correct way, a proper way, okay? And a lot of that time has to do with, you'll hear me harping on this a lot, a core and hip strength, okay? So instead of using all their body to, to develop that momentum, they're just really muscling it with their, with their arm, okay? So get them into PT, you can get them going with core and hip strengthening, then eventually when the pain gets better, the x-rays look better, then you can start this return to throw program. They have all the, all the supporting structures all, all keyed up, queued up and ready to go, okay? So that that's, can be helpful that way. Moving on to the back. This is like, this is like you know, like Cliff notes, this is like the highlights of, sport, of youth sports medicine. Back pain, um, we see a lot of it now, and um, I'm gonna talk specifically about one, because I think it's the one that with kids who are most concerned about, because you don't see as much like degenerative disc problems. Um, you can see disc stuff uh, in kids, so I just say it's not as common. Um, so this is spondylolysis, okay? Um, it's a mouthful. Uh, I've heard some people pronounce it spondylolysis. Um, uh, it, as you, you see it more often, you kind of just shorten it up to spondy. Um, just because it's easier. Um, but it's a, it's a stress fracture in the pars interarticular, so it's right here, okay? Um, usually these are people who have a lot of back extension uh, activities, but this doesn't need to be, I mean, obviously the most common ones are like gymnasts, divers, um, cheer, or competitive dance, That's, those are really common ones to see it in. But I've also seen it in basketball players, volleyball players, uh, swimmers, anybody who kind of goes like this, wrestlers will get it, football linemen will get it. Okay, because as they come out of their stance, they come up to hit someone and they're getting loaded in this, in this back extension position. Okay, so that's the big thing, it's the trunk extension, okay? And that's another big thing as far as when you examine them is to say, oh, I just did this. Okay, so you can kind of see here how like soccer players kind of arch back when they're, when they're kicking, uh, volleyball players arch back when they're uh, blocking or, or, or hitting or, or spiking. So those are the ones. Um, this will often be, uh, it'll be gradual onset uh, it usually is not something where it's like, hey, I did this one thing and it, that caused it to hurt. Um, most, almost all of them are at the L5, S1 uh, intersection, so technically on L5. Um, and the big thing with this is that when you examine them and when they start describing, it's gonna be pain with extension.
Okay, so if they have pain with flexion and extension, it's kind of more a mixed picture, hey, and uh, that doesn't sound as convincing. But if it's pure extension-based pain, then it's kind of like, hey, I, I, we really need this. A lot of times they will have this hyperlordosis thing, and this, you know, it's like the classic gymnastics ta-da position, you know, where they go like this, which is, I don't know what the function of that is, but people do it. It's just kind of part of the culture. It's like they love to do it. Um, so they do it a lot, right, in addition to the, you know, back handsprings and stuff like that. But, um, but think about that hyperlordosis that, that happens with that. So you can get plain radiographs, and I like to get plain radiographs. They used to say to get four views, which are the, the obliques. We've really gone away from getting the obliques. Just get AP and lateral. And you're kind of like doing this a little bit because back pain in kids, I was kind of always taught it was a mantra of it's just not normal, okay? It's not a normal thing. You don't just say, hey, you have back pain, whatever, suck it up, go. You shouldn't say suck it up and go to any kid. But, you know, usually their pain is from something, right? And so this will, it's just an easy way of ruling out really bad goombas, right? Really bad things, the bad players. An easy way of just making sure there's not a, a, a a bone invasive tumor or something like that, okay? Um, obliques really, there's a lot of radiation with these and lumbar films and I'm, I'm all for getting x-rays like I said, but the obliques just, the sensitivity is so low that we've really gone away from them. But if you read textbooks and stuff, they'd be like, oh, get the oblique views. You're looking for the Scott, you know, the Scotty dog where you see this little, uh, um, you see a little break in the neck, there's a collar. Uh, on the Scotty dog, and that's that's a sign of it. Well, if you see one, great, that's awesome. But the the sensitivity is so low that the obliques just aren't worth it anymore. Bone spec scan is kind of like the standard. This is a combination of a nuclear med scan and a CT scan. I'm going to put a big caveat on there that there's movement away from theirs, okay? Because it's nuclear med, nuclear med and CT scan combined, and depends a little bit on institutions. At Seattle Children's, we are still, and our uh, MSK radiologists still are much more comfortable. Uh, with bone spec, but this is, you're getting kind of more cusp of the state of the art thing. MRI is, is probably going to be coming back. Some institutions I've worked at in the past, MRI was really the way to go. Um, but you, it requires certain cuts and it requires certain MSK facilities uh, to get it, but there's no radiation with it and it can show that. Plus it can show all the other stuff that might be, that you might be worried about. Plus if there is a, a mixed picture, then you maybe it can show you what's happening with the disc or, or the foramen to say, is there a nerve impingement going on? It's a little bit longer story, but bone spec is the classic one. If you're taking boards, that's probably what they're going to ask for. But MRI is starting to become, again, it's been used at other institutions, but I think it's getting more and more push to use that instead. So the treatment, the big thing is that you, you need to stop the extension. Okay, so this is one where it depends on their pain and what they're doing, but um, I might say, hey, you just need to not do this for now. Um, can they do core and upper body strengthening? Maybe. I definitely would hold off on doing any like military press because a lot of times when people do military press, as they start to push up, they go into extension, okay? So you just got to th think a little bit about that. Um, but typically with activity modification and PT, again, using the supporting structures, you can get really good he healing with this. It's a little more complicated down the road, especially if you get to the point where you have bilateral spondies, then you can have spondylolisthesis where the vertebrae actually slips forward and that's a different thing altogether. You will still find some people who will brace spondies. Um, the literature really doesn't support it. There's equal uh, um, outcomes whether you brace them or not, but you'll still find some people that will brace. I tend not to and I can't tell you when the last time I wrote a prescription for, for a brace for this um, because there's no benefit to it and you tend to have to wear it for it has to be a rigid one. If you're going to do it, it tends to be 23 hours a day, which is not super comfortable. Um, so given the, what we know about the outcomes, I, and most, most of the docs I know don't use bracing anymore. There's a few, there's a, like I said, there's a few, and it depends on if you go, like Boston Children's as an institution still does it, uh, Akron still does it. Um, those are really the two that I know. Um, and then there's individual providers, and oftentimes they're associated, have some association in their past with those institutions. So it's a repetitive, it's an overuse injury. Um, one thing with overuse injuries like this um, that I start thinking about is um, why they got it. Um, not only overuse, but I start thinking about like, hey, is there an issue with energy availability? Um, so asking about nutrition, um, asking if they're uh, old enough to have started their period, asking them if they're having regular periods or if they've started at all. Um, these can be a sign that they aren't getting enough uh, nutrition and especially with cheer and dance and. Uh, gymnastics, I think these more aesthetic sports, they, they can be associated with that. Um, so 
having a low threshold to uh, get nutrition involved. Um, we are not nutritionist uh, providers in general. Um, there's a reason why they go to nutrition school. They're really good at it. They're really good at teasing that out. Um, and so that is something to think, really think about. So here are references uh, for you. Obviously, there's a lot, and you can look up a lot more of this. 